Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of the Coordination and Maintenance Committee meeting. Uh, we'll be picking up on diagnosis proposals this morning, um, but before we uh, launch into those proposals, just a few reminders. Um, and for those who may not have been here or with us through webcast or on the phone yesterday, a few key dates to keep in mind. Uh, comments for um, proposals presented yesterday and today are due uh, November 15th. Again, we prefer to receive your written comments by email as opposed to snail mail to ensure that we're actually able to receive them and review them in time. Um, for those who are considering proposals for the March 19th and 20th meeting, those proposals will do uh, to CMS for procedures on January 17th and to CDC and CHS uh, for diagnosis. Um, and then for those who may not have the opportunity to prepare proposals for the March meeting, the deadline for comments um, for the September meeting, which is September 23 and 24, is July 19, and all that information is in your handout uh, in the timeline. CEU information is in the topic package on page 10. You can read that for yourself. I won't go through all of those things. Um, and for those of you who want to go back and review some of the topics that were presented yesterday, or just have a refresher on anything that is presented today, the webcast for the um, presentations will be available on the CMS website at some point after the meeting. With that, I am now going to turn the podium over to Beth Fisher, who will lead the discussion in the uh, next proposal. Beth? Good morning. Um, uh, as Donna said, we did present quite a number of topics yesterday, and uh, so we're actually all the way down to page 47, which is the topic entitled Unintended Awareness Under General Anesthesia. And um, for those of you who haven't been here before, I'll present the topic and uh, the proposal, and then we'll invite comments. Uh, from the audience and when you do make comments we ask you to use the microphone in the middle of the aisle there so that those that are listening on webcast and on the telephone can also hear the comments. Um, in extremely rare cases a patient can become conscious during surgery and subsequently recall what occurred. This experience referred to as interoperative awareness or oh, anesthesia awareness is estimated to occur about one to two times every 1,000 uses of general anesthesia. While most patients do not experience any pain due to, in, due to interoperative awareness, uh, it can be disturbing, and in fact, uh, it can cause significant psychological sequela, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, and it may occur after, that may occur after an episode of interoperative awareness, and the affected patients may remain severely disabled for extended periods of time. However, in some circumstances, interoperative awareness may be unavoidable, to achieve other critically important anesthetic goals. Uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists defines awareness during surgery as applying only to patients who are under general anesthesia and that intraoperative awareness does not include the following. Uh, the period of time just prior to the anesthesia completely taking effect or as the patient is emerging from anesthesia and when sedatives are administered during local or regional anesthetic such as a nerve block, spinal or epidural. In these cases, it is expected that patients will have some recollection of the procedure. And patients who receive sedation and not general anesthesia for procedures outside of the operating room, this can include dental procedures, upper GI endoscopies, and colonoscopies, and awareness is not unusual for these procedures. And you may, if you've attended these meetings before, may recall that a number of years ago, we did create a code for, I think, failed conscious sedation for cases similar to this third bullet point. The American Society of Anesthesiologists is requesting the establishment of an ICD-10 CM code to describe this uncommon instance in which a patient experiences unintended awareness under general anesthesia, as well as a code to track a history of this unintended awareness 
Availability of these codes will further research into the factors that contribute to unintended awareness, including methods to reduce its occurrence and to correctly identify patients who experience the condition, thus facilitating both acute management and appropriate care during future anesthetics. So on page 48 of our topic packet, um, the following ICD-10 CM modifications are being proposed. At category T88, which is other complications of surgical and medical care not elsewhere classified, under subcategory T88.5, other complications of anesthesia, we propose a new code, T88.53, unintended awareness under general anesthesia during procedure. And we would add an excludes note, excludes two, for personal history of unintended awareness under general anesthesia to the Z code that I'll propose below. Under category Z92, personal history of medical treatment, Z92.8, personal history of other medical treatment, we propose a new code Z92.84, personal history of unintended awareness under general anesthesia, with again an excludes two note to uh, point the coder back to unintended awareness under general anesthesia during a procedure back to the T88.53 code. Are there any questions or comments at this time? And if you could state your name when you make your comment, thank you. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Robert Adams. I just have a few words to say. First, I'd like to thank you all for all your hard work. And if you are ever at your office or dealing with lots of numbers and codes that uh, you're afraid that you don't have an effect on patients or at the end user, I want you to know that I personally consider your work very important. There are, and, it, and you really do can make a difference. I'd also like to thank Donna Pickett for her patience and understanding and inspiring me to contact the ASA on this matter. So let me begin with my statement. I would respectfully like to thank all those assembled here today. I appreciate your listening to my short statement. I pray that you all take this statement as I intended, with gratitude, appreciation, and most importantly, with patient safety in mind. I am not an anesthetist, nor am I affiliated with any clinical studies or other healthcare organizations. Honestly, I was lucky to pass Regents Biology. However, I am a patient who has suffered from unintended intraoperative awareness. I would like to thank the entire ASA and all its board members, but by name I'd like to thank Ms. Sharon Merrick for being so tenacious and spirited in putting forth this application for unintended intraoperative awareness. I'm also very grateful to, for all the hard and diligent work of all those involved in bringing forth this diagnostic code shows to me how a few brave individuals dedicated to patient safety can make the world's healthcare system more effective, transparent, and most importantly, safe. I'm grateful to the anesthesiology community in its entirety for recognizing that this complication requires its own ICD-10 diagnostic code. With great trepidation and apprehension, I am here today to speak for those patients that, at this very moment, may be having an unintended intraoperative awareness episode. And that is why quickly implementing this code is so important. The research indicates the window is closing on these people. Without proper follow-up, they are almost certain to develop negative long-term complications, including, like me, profound PTSD. On their behalf, I plead with this community to give the healthcare providers the necessary tools to properly diagnose, chart, and most importantly, treat this most terrible complication. On behalf of all patients, I plead with you to give the, us the validation so many of us crave, to allow us the opportunity to get the correct care and to help make certain this horrible thing doesn't happen to us again at any time in the future. Until you make this brave decision and make this new diagnostic code part of the ICD-10 manual, most of us will be and will forever remain misdiagnosed. We will remain victims, not patients. I cannot speak for all anesthetists. In my experience, some are brave, some are cowards. But I should like to think that this complication is not new to any of them. I'd like to think that this code will give even the most cowardly anesthetists the tools necessary to properly diagnose and subsequently treat this terrible complication. It is my hope, nay, the hope of all patients and victims, 
that any diagnostician can soon make a proper diagnosis without fear of reprisals or professional stigmatism and give the patient the validation and treatment required by the current protocols. I hope I have had an opportunity to express my opinion on this topic. I most importantly hope I have not done a disservice to those patients past, present, and future who will so very much benefit from this new code. Again, I'd like to thank the committee and all the attendees present here and elsewhere for listening to me and giving this matter your heartfelt consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Uh, do we have any other comments? Okay, well, as Donna pointed out, written comments are also welcome uh, in the due date being November 15th. I'll turn the agenda back over to Donna. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, topics in the agenda, and we'll be starting on page 32, and this will be the beginning of discussions on mental health conditions and harmonization of the new DSM-5 with ICD-10-CM. I'll be joined on the podium by Dr. Daryl Regeer, who will introduce himself, and we'll go through the topics one by one. Dr. Regeer. Thank you, Donna. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, I am uh, the Director of Research at the American Psychiatric Association and uh, served as uh, the Vice Chair of the DSM-5 Task Force, which uh, completed its work uh, at the end of uh, 2012 uh, when we uh, finished uh, what was really a uh, more of a, than a decade of uh, work on this, uh, this project. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the DSM um, history, I'll give a brief uh, uh, reprise of this and then uh, I'll go into the specific codes. Uh, basically, the reason for having a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders in addition to the uh, ICD uh, was because of the uh, finding really in the uh, late 60s that the failure to have explicit diagnostic criteria for mental disorders uh, would result in very large differences in coding for specific uh, disorders. Uh, the classic history was that in a, the US-UK study um, there were very different uh, rates of uh, uh, kind of admission for uh, schizophrenia uh, and for uh, manic depressive illness in London hospitals compared to uh, the rates in New York hospitals. This was found by a statistician at the NIMH. Uh, and um, a study was con uh, convened to see if, in fact, there was something different uh, about the water in uh, London or in New York that was causing these major differences. Uh, and in fact, what they found was that the uh, lack of uh, kind of a common terminology and um, and criteria for these disorders was the reason for the, the substantial differences. Uh, DSM-3 in 1980 basically took this to heart and uh, identified explicit diagnostic criteria for individual disorders, uh, which improved the reliability of such diagnoses. <clears throat> and um, we've had a major revision of the DSM-3 code in 1994, which was the DSM-4, uh, or fourth edition, and uh, there really has not been any substantial uh, change in that until we began the um, review of, uh, for ICD-11 and for DSM-5 <clears throat> that really started in a joint effort with WHO and the National Institutes of Health uh, beginning in about uh, uh, 2000. So uh, we worked on a, um, a joint effort uh, with the WHO and NIH from uh, 2003 then to 2008. Uh, and uh, the, a task force for DSM-4 uh, was then uh, really assembled uh, and began its uh, work in 2008. So it's been working on <clears throat> the whole range of mental disorders uh, until they completed this at the end of 2012. Now, um, one of the reasons, I know there's 
major concern within the coding community of having uh, kind of last minute changes to the ICD-10 CM uh, now that um, it is about to go into effect in October of uh, 2014. <clears throat> and uh, an enormous amount of work has taken place with um, uh, getting computer uh, code into place. Uh, and so there really needs to be a rationale for why some changes now. Uh, I think uh, some of the reasons uh, for, for this is that the mental health community in the U.S. and in fact the research community around the world has been using DSM um, you know, primarily for uh, coding uh, you know, since uh, 1980. Um, and the American Psychiatric Association has worked very closely with the uh, National Center for Health Statistics throughout this period of time to coordinate the coding so that we are using uh, the appropriate ICD-10, uh, ICD-9-CM coding um, uh, conventions and uh, uh, anticipating the ICD-10-CM coding uh, conventions uh, as of October uh, 1st, uh, 2014. Uh, however, in the course of this uh, decade-long review, uh, there were some substantial recommend, recommendations of uh, how mental disorders should most appropriately be described and coded. Um, <clears throat> what has happened is that um, in some cases uh, disorder names were changed. Uh, an example of this would be instead of substance use or alcohol use, uh, alcohol uh, abuse and dependence, uh, the decision was made that this would, there were not two separate disorders, that this disorder was on a continuum uh, from mild, moderate, severe, uh, and so the, the condition is now changed from a um, uh, alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence to uh, alcohol use disorder, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, and that requires then a different um, uh, name in the index. It includes different, uh, it will require different inclusion terms uh, in the tabular uh, and the like. And in fact, there are probably about 300 such changes that uh, took place from some of the, in, in the tabular or the alphabetic index that uh, are going to uh, need to be recognized. Now, the reason for uh, making sure that we coordinate with ICD uh, first of all, 9CM and 10CM, is that coders who receive the new diagnostic uh, information uh, on the chart are going to have to find what is the most appropriate code for this condition. Uh, and um, it, you know, they could obviously uh, look to the uh, DSM-5 uh, uh, to obtain this, but in many cases, uh, coders use exclusively the ICD uh, uh, 10 CM. So it is going to be important for um, uh, the coders in the community to be aware of this. Now, what we have done to um, uh, facilitate this is that in the, um, what is now the, this is the cover of the DSM-5, uh, it's a fairly large book. Uh, by the time ICD-10 um, CM is uh, introduced, there will probably be at least uh, half a million copies of this in circulation. There are now almost 400,000 uh, copies of this in circulation in the uh, uh, mental health community. So the mental health community will be using this, and so the codes are going to be, um, you know, the, the terms that are in the DSM uh, are going to be all over medical records, um, you know, whether it's in a general medical setting or in a mental health setting. Um, what we have done in this volume is actually code both the ICD-9-CM codes and then in parentheses we put the ICD-10-CM codes so that in fact the DSM-5 will be an automatic crosswalk uh, between the ICD-9-CM and the ICD-10-CM. Um, so uh, what's important about this is that uh, many state and federal laws actually require the DSM specificity 
uh, for looking at quality measures and for looking at uh, compliance with um, uh, kind of uh, treatment protocols and the like, and it's used uh, for fraud and abuse uh, determinations and um, for other uh, kind of clinical and training uh, purposes. So in any case, um, that's some of the background of why we think it's going to be important for us to be able to incorporate these terms into the ICD-10-CM uh, as, as soon as possible. Now, uh, what I want to focus on today is actually the specific disorders that are new disorders as opposed to some of the combined uh, disorders that I mentioned, uh, I illustrated with the substance uh, abuse and dependence being combined into a substance use disorder. Um, the first one that we have identified is binge eating disorder on page 32 uh, of your um, uh, agenda for, for this meeting. Now, binge eating disorder is a new disorder in DSM-5 uh, specifically because um, it's been clear for some time that um, the, uh, there's a somewhat different group of uh, people who are, uh, who are bulimic who have a combination of uh, binge eating and also of purging, uh, of uh, self-induced uh, vomiting often. Uh, and um, this group of uh, patients who have relatively severe uh, binge eating uh, episodes, and it's, uh, it's not your occasional uh, Thanksgiving Day dinner or something. Uh, this is repeated binge eating, you know, throughout the week, um, you know, and it has to be present for months at a time. And so this requires um, a different, uh, a somewhat different uh, intervention uh, clinically. Uh, it is separate from anorexia nervosa, uh, from bulimia nervosa, and um, it is, uh, it's been identified frequently in eating disorder centers. Uh, and as a result, the recommendation has been that um, uh, we need to include this as a separate disorder. Uh, unfortunately, um, in many eating disorder clinics, uh, about 50% of the disorders that they see do not qualify for the existing diagnostic codes. And so there's been a uh, concerted effort to actually identify two new eating disorders. One is this binge eating disorder, uh, and the other is, uh, is one that is mentioned on page 33, uh, but we did not include it uh, this time um, in this particular uh, recommendation today as a separate disorder, but it, it will be included for the March meeting. Uh, the other disorder is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Uh, and this is a specific kind of disorder where individuals uh, will come in and will be restricting their diet to only perhaps one type of food, whether it's by texture or by color uh, or by some other measure, it's like only eating white food or only eating french fries or only eating, you know, a certain type of uh, food. Uh, this can have really fairly serious uh, nutritional um, and um, uh, disability uh, implications in the long run. And it's, uh, there was a previous disorder that was called um, a uh, feeding disorder of infancy and childhood. Uh, and this uh, was a rarely used um, uh, designation. Uh, what we have done, though, is that we have uh, combined that disorder with this uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is uh, you know, a rather awkward acronym of ARFID uh, that uh, is being used. Uh, and both of these uh, disorders um, would currently uh, end up in the F50 Point eight other eating disorders. Uh, our recommendation is that we include uh, these as uh, uh, both tabular terms and as um, uh, inclusions in the uh, in the index, so that the when when these terms come through the um, uh, the medical records uh, for coders and the like, that they are recognized. Uh, we've also talked with Donna about um, uh, for 2015. 
uh, when it's possible to actually have a specific code for these as opposed to just an inclusion term under other um, you know, eating disorders, so the F50.8, that we would include a specific code of F50.81 for binge eating disorder, and we will recommend uh, an additional code like the F50.82 for the avoidant uh, and restrictive uh, food intake disorder. Um, I can stop after each one of these and just pause and see if uh, there are any um, specific questions uh, or recommendations from the audience as well. Okay. And again, as you see in the uh, proposal on page 33, you have two separate things that we'd like you to comment on. The first being whether or not index entries and tabular list entries should be included uh, for October 1, 2014, and then separately comments on the creation of new codes for these conditions effective October 1, 2015. So we invite your comments on both sets of proposals. Um, and if there are no questions, I'll turn the microphone back over to Dr. Riguer. Thank you. <clears throat> now, the, the next um, coding uh, recommendation uh, is for gen uh, the um, gender identity disorder in adolescence and adulthood. Uh, there was a major interest um, in the transgender community uh, of changing the name, first of all, of gender identity disorder, uh, removing the term disorder, and retaining uh, certainly a diagnosis, but of focusing, uh, renaming this to be a gender dysphoria, um, so that it was uh, clear that the, the, um, the problem that these individuals have is not with um, basically uh, uh, with their chosen uh, gender, but it's with the discomfort that they have of not being able to achieve the gender that they believe they were born to, um, uh, to have, uh, despite the fact that their biological gender is different uh, than, than what they believe their identity uh, you know, uh, requires. And so these individuals uh, obviously uh, choose to have either hormone therapy uh, or uh, surgical uh, sex reassignment uh, at some time in their life. And um, in order to uh, obtain this, they really require a diagnosis. Now, uh, we've had in the uh, ICD-10-CM a code that was for uh, uh, dual role transvestism um, that uh, was uh, unfortunately uh, the wrong code that was recommended by the APA back um, uh, a decade or so ago. Uh, we were, uh, this particular code uh, that, we, that was identified uh, as F64.1 uh, in the ICD-10-CM uh, describes this dual role transvestism as an individual who enjoys cross-dressing but has no interest in a sexual reassignment. Um, we were notified that this was an incorrect code actually by colleagues uh, from Germany uh, who saw the DSM-5 uh, uh, and when we posted it on the website um, I should mention that in the developmental period, we posted draft criteria three times in, in uh, 2010, 2011, and 2012 for kind of international and national commentary uh, on what our proposed criteria were. Uh, we received over 13,000 comments, um, written comments uh, uh, in response to our website postings. Um, and uh, what happened is that uh, this one actually didn't come through uh, because we weren't posting codes uh, until the, uh, the book was actually published. And when the book was published in May of uh, 2013, 
we then got some feedback from the international community that we uh, were using the wrong code for this. So um, the correct code would be uh, F64.0 transsexualism. Uh, and what we are, uh, and this is uh, the inclusion term for this would be gender identity disorder in adolescence and adulthood. Uh, and we would want to include the, the, the new term of gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults. At some time in the future, we would be proposing that the name transsexualism be changed as well to, uh, to gender dysphoria, uh, as opposed to retaining that name. Uh, changing a name once the ICD or the WHO establishes the name is often a big deal. Um, we have... Um, I had some experience with this uh, with the DSM-3. Uh, what used to be called psychotic depression was changed to be, changed to be major depressive disorder. Uh, and uh, that was very important for patients uh, because they would get a, uh, a kind of a message back uh, that their uh, mental health clinician was calling, saying they had a major depressive disorder. And when they got their, their bill, uh, it would say they had psychotic depression, uh, and they objected to that. And I think what will happen is, um, given the, uh, the uh, agreement that gender dysphoria is the preferred term by this community, they will eventually uh, say, we want to change transsexualism to the term gender dysphoria more generally. But for now, we're simply staying with the transsexualism um, uh, name, and adding inclusion terms and correcting the code so that we're in agreement with international conventions of having the F64.1 refer to this uh, condition in adolescence and adulthood. There is a separate code, the F64.2, which is currently gender identity disorder of childhood. Um, that is the correct code internationally, but we would change the name of that just to gender dysphoria in children. So with that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions on this particular uh, item. Uh, a few things to note about the proposal on uh, page 34 is that F64.0 would be a new code as being proposed here. Um, and so it would be bringing forward a code that had not been in ICD-10 CM previously. At F64.1, uh, the proposal is to actually revise the title uh, and make that dual role transvestism. Um, but again, that requires a change uh, that may not um, be in keeping with the criteria that was set forth for changes. So we do specifically invite comment on this. And as Dr. Regeer has explained, uh, some of these terms are new terms, new concepts. Um, and so how best to uh, accommodate those changes um, that the clinicians will be using into ICD-10-CM is extremely important. And we do look for your input on that. Um, also at F64.1, the inclusion term dual role transvestism would be deleted because that is proposed as being the new code title for F64.1. Um, and the addition of a new um, inclusion term at F64.2 is also proposed. So we will definitely seek your guidance on that. And based on discussions from yesterday, I'm sure we'll be getting lots of comments from you on um, the viability of doing that uh, during the freeze um, and leading up to preparations for actually finalizing your testing, et cetera, and being prepared for October 1, 2014, go live date. Uh, any questions? Okay, Daryl. <clears throat> okay, the next. Uh, proposed change is on page 35, uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. This code is being, and disorder is being introduced uh, primarily because of the 
I think public awareness of the major increase in prevalence of pediatric bipolar disorder. Um, the reason for the major increase in prevalence was a recommendation made um, uh, probably starting in about 2000 uh, to 2004 uh, by uh, Harvard University a child psychiatrist who had uh, recommended that uh, persistent irritability uh, and rage reactions in children should properly be identified as a form of bipolar disorder. Now, what has been present in the DSM for some time is that uh, for uh, children, uh, it's not only possible to have um, bipolar disorder if you have the kind of euphoria and hypomania or mania that is present, um, that is typical of um, adult uh, kind of bipolar disorder, and that is episodic in nature. It doesn't, it's not there persistently. It just comes in waves. It comes in episodes. Um, and people with bipolar disorder generally recover either with treatment or even without treatment, uh, these episodes of uh, mania or hypomania, you know, tend to recede and uh, individuals can often function at uh, a normal or close to normal, um, you know, level of, um, of activity. Um, however, uh, for children, instead of um, uh, hypomania or mania, it has been recognized that these individuals may ex exhibit extreme irritability as opposed to mania. And so the presence of the irritability um, kind of symptom as a uh, component of uh, bipolar disorder uh, has been present for some time. But what was different is the idea that instead of having episodes of care, a persistent um, form of this uh, condition was the equivalent of bipolar disorder in children. Well, <clears throat> uh, as a result of this, uh, individuals were uh, placed generally on uh, atypical antipsychotic medications uh, and the uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, prevalence, uh, treated prevalence of uh, uh, pediatric bipolar disorder has skyrocketed as has the use of um, atypical antipsychotic medications in children. Um, this was considered to be a public health as well as uh, kind of clinical, uh, you know, uh, issue of major concern. And so the NIMH actually initiated a fairly comprehensive study of what, you know, what was referred to initially as severe mood dysregulation disorder in childhood <clears throat> and uh, uh, tried to separate uh, individuals with um, true episodic kind of bipolar disorder in terms of their family history, in terms of the uh, uh, kind of genetic history then associated with family, in terms of clinical course what happens if they're diagnosed long-term? Do they actually end up becoming bipolar as adults or not? Uh, they also did uh, a lot of um, uh, imaging studies to look at the difference in neurocircuitry uh, of the uh, children who came in with this and separating bipolar, the severe mood dysregulation, and even ADHD uh, children. Uh, and they found that these uh, individuals with severe mood dysregulation are really a different uh, group of children uh, in terms of their genetic history, in terms of their uh, longitudinal clinical course, in terms of their uh, kind of biological uh, findings with uh, neuroimaging. And so uh, the recommendation uh, was to uh, uh, introduce this, uh, this um, term. There was a lot of um, controversy of um, of what would you name this thing? And, and this was all over the press for a period of time. Was this just uh, simper, simply temper tantrums uh, that these kids had? Uh, or was this really a serious disorder? Uh, the condition uh, was identified, uh, I think, uh, fairly well characterized as a, um, as a severe disorder. Uh, one has to have these symptoms for a year. Uh, they have to have several episodes of this every week. Uh, and it's, um, 
and for those uh, families who have had the experience of this, this, is, this can be a, an incredibly disruptive um, and um, uh, often uh, you know, very damaging uh, kind of disorder when left untreated uh, in families. So the recommendation for now is to have this uh, labeled under the other persistent mood affective disorders uh, um, current code, the F34.8, but to add the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder or DMDD uh, as a um, uh, inclusion term, uh, certainly in the tabular modification uh, and uh, to add it um, in the index modifications uh, so that um, for 2014, uh, that's the only change that would be made. Uh, I can tell you that insurance companies uh, are very interested in having a separate code so that it would be separated out from just uh, other specified persistent mood disorders so that um, uh, it would get uh, an appropriate uh, coding and recognition. The, the concern is that uh, sometimes insurance companies don't recognize uh, some of these um, point eight uh, codes as uh, requiring uh, the kind of the level of care that uh, that individuals with these disorders require. And so uh, certainly for 2015, uh, we would like to uh, assist the insurance companies by having a specific code, which would be the F34.81, uh, that they could use to um, be able to capture this, uh, this group of uh, children. With that, I'll stop for any questions. <clears throat> And again, as Dr. Regeer has indicated, for October 1, 2014, the proposal is to add an inclusion term at F34.8. Um, and on page 36, to have an index entry. And for the index entry, the code would be F34.8. Um, it's just missing from the uh, um, information in the topic package. But it would be the same as what is shown as comparable to the tabular list change. And for 2015, uh, the proposal of new codes. And again, we invite comment both on um, your thoughts on the 2014 changes for index and tabular, mm -hmm. and also specifically on the 2015 change for the new codes. Are there any questions? Back to you. <clears throat> Okay, the next code uh, change would be focusing on the social pragmatic communication disorder uh, in, um, on page 37 uh, is some of the background and then on page uh, 38 are the specific uh, recommendations. The reason for this code change has to do with the overall change of the codes for uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, in DSM-4, there were four separate disorders, uh, Asperger's uh, syndrome, uh, autism spectrum disorder, pervasive development, uh, de developmental disorder, uh, not otherwise specified, PDD-NOS, and Rett syndrome, um, and also a child, that's five, a childhood uh, disintegrative disorder in which uh, children uh, kind of initially present with an autistic presentation, but then actually have a severe, uh, you know, worsening of the condition uh, so that it uh, becomes uh, a much more severe disorder even than uh, autism. Um, what the um, research literature has shown over the last 20 years is that it is really not possible to separate uh, autism, Asperger's, uh, PDD, and OS, uh, those are the three major ones. The Rett syndrome is a genetic condition that temporarily, you know, in girls, that uh, temporarily presents as, uh, um, as autism, uh, but then disappears. And as I said, the uh, childhood disintegrative disorder is a relatively rare condition. But what we found in the, uh, in clinical care and in research studies is that the diagnosis of autism spectrum, 
Asperger's or PDD NOS depended greatly on the jurisdiction in which the uh, individual resided, uh, which depended a great deal on the benefits that were available for educational and treatment uh, in health insurance in those uh, particular states. Uh, in California, Asperger's disorder virtually didn't exist. In Connecticut, uh, it was far more prevalent uh, than, uh, in many cases, uh, other disorders like PDD NOS or, um, or autism. And so the, um, and, and what was found is that, that when even research centers tried to differentiate individuals with these conditions, that they simply could not do so in a reliable fashion. Uh, and so <clears throat> what was decided is that it was much more scientifically credible to describe these children with autism uh, on a spectrum uh, with two uh, major uh, components, either social communication uh, impairment or uh, restrictive repetitive behaviors and interests, the RRBs. And those two criteria uh, needed to be described on a spectrum from mild, moderate, severe, uh, and that it would be much more helpful to have those, um, those um, specific uh, criteria rated individually in order to help guide treatment uh, and not lump everything into one uh, kind of um, uh, treatment uh, uh, guideline in order to uh, you know, assist um, both the states and the, you know, who are struggling with educational plans and the uh, clinical community that needs to tailor its treatment to the deficits that the individual child uh, or even adult might have. So, what became very clear, though, in uh, this research is that there was a group of children, often with a diagnosis of PDD NOS, uh, who actually only had impairment in social communication, that they had no impairments with these restricted, repetitive behaviors, often rocking kind of behaviors or other kinds of, you know, fixated interests where you could not get the kid uh, focused, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, removed, you know, altered from a very uh, specific area. Um, this, that it really required having both of these, you know, social communication com components and the restricted repetitive or RRB uh, behavior and interests, um, you know, uh, criteria in order to qualify for autism. Uh, and certainly the criteria for Asperger's requires that, uh, that both of these be present uh, as well as the required for the autism and DSM-4. So <clears throat> uh, in order to accommodate this, uh, we wanted to make sure that the children who had uh, you know, these severe uh, social pragmatic communication uh, disorder problems were certainly treated uh, and that an appropriate um, you know, level of service for these uh, children was possible, but they needed to have a specific code uh, in order and disorder uh, criteria set in order to receive such treatment. So what we have uh, recommended here is that uh, for now, the only area, the closest approximation, certainly within the ICD-10-CM, would be a specific developmental disorder of speech and language. Um, and uh, uh, within that would be the other uh, developmental disorders of speech and language. We would, would like to have um, certainly a separate code for this eventually. Right now the .89, uh, F80.89 is the only uh, appropriate code to go to, but we wanted the inclusion term of social pragmatic communication disorder added under that and then for 2015, we would need to have a, um, a specific uh, code for the social uh, pragmatic communication disorder that could be the F80.82. Uh, so that in, in fact, insurance companies uh, um, and you know, uh, state education uh, departments and uh, um, kind of health departments would be able to uh, you know, develop appropriate um, uh, prevalence rates uh, based on 
uh, claims data and the like that would enable them to, um, to really get a better sense of what the um, uh, public health need is for uh, interventions for this particular condition. So with that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions. <clears throat> So again, we're asking uh, for your comments on the proposed changes to be effective October 1, 2014. That would be the inclusion of the term under uh, F8089 and, and a companion change in the alphabetic index under disorder uh, to add social pragmatic communication with the code F8089 and the new code proposals for 2015 are shown here, and again, we're inviting comment on that as well. And if there are no questions. Okay. Yeah. I should mention that this, um, this is a um, condition that doesn't just involve you know, mental health clinicians, it really involves the educational community and the speech language hearing uh, you know, uh, uh, professional community as well. And in fact, uh, an expert in the speech uh, hearing um, you know, community was uh, very much involved in the development of this recommendation uh, as well with the DSM-5 uh, task force. So the, the next disorder is hoarding disorder. Um, and this is found on page 39 and uh, page 40. Um, hoarding disorder is actually um, a condition that is fairly well known in the uh, state county public health commissioners and um, uh, offices uh, because um, these um, individuals are often called uh, to deal with a severe hoarding problem uh, that uh, starts to affect neighbors uh, in the community. Uh, the homes get uh, filled up with uh, various forms of material, some of which is flammable, uh, f causing a fire hazard. Um, other times the homes get filled up with animals uh, that causes uh, kind of a sanitation and um, other uh, kinds of uh, problems in the community. And unfortunately, uh, these uh, individuals have often been um, characterized in um, kind of cable TV shows uh, as kind of the, the modern equivalent of the bedlam um, kind of um, freak shows uh, that um, you know, occurred uh, you know, with uh, raving uh, psychotic individuals that uh, the public would come and watch them uh, you know, in um, kind of the old days, if you will. Um, I think that it's really unfortunate that, that um, I think uh, cable TV has, uh, has focused on uh, individuals with these kinds of severe disorders. Uh, we think that what is needed uh, is really uh, an attention to treatment uh, of these individuals and a uh, public health um, recognition that these are separate disorders. Now, in the past, individuals with this condition may have been coded as having, say, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, but a lot of research has taken place to show that, in fact, individuals with these conditions don't have the usual checking or hand washing or other obsessional repetitive thinking uh, types of um, behaviors that are characteristic of the of obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, and so, however, we do uh, think that this is uh, within the large category of uh, uh, obsessive compulsive uh, spectrum disorders. It is just a very distinct condition that is different from obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, as a result, though, of um, of this and um, we have uh, recommended that it be placed in, a, in the chapter that contains obsessive compulsive disorder that has only one code, which is F42, without even uh, any, um, any specific uh, decimal uh, codes after that. Now, uh, even though the ICD-10 the WHO 
uh, has, uh, has a, um, breaks out mixed obsessional thoughts and acts and breaks out just focusing on uh, obsessional uh, thoughts versus um, obsessional behaviors. Um, the recommendation at the time that um, DSM-4 was made is that these conditions tend to occur uh, together. It's very rare to have an, an individual just with obsessional thoughts or just with uh, uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors. And so the recommendation that the DSM-4 had made is basically suppress the, uh, the additional uh, decimal codes in F42. And you will see that the only code that's in uh, ICD-10-CM is F42 without any decimals. So what we have had to do at the present time is to add hoarding disorder as a uh, inclusion term under obsessive compulsive disorder, but uh, we are recommending uh, in order to really aid in the public health uh, epidemiology of um, hoarding disorder to have a separate code for this by the time 2015 uh, comes around. In the meantime, uh, I think uh, what would be necessary for coding is that uh, individuals will have to put in F42. They'll have to put in parentheses and in, in text uh, that this happens to be hoarding disorder and not obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, and that that's the only way that um, uh, they'll be able to um, differentiate that in any uh, electronic records that, uh, that don't capture text um, as part of them, which most insurance companies don't capture text, they only capture the numerical codes. So that is a problem for ICD-9-CM and for ICD-10-CM until we can get, you know, a separate code hopefully uh, by the time of 2015. So with that I'll stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, so to recap, for 2014, we're proposing an index entry um, in, under disorder and an inclusion term in the tabular list. For 2015, uh, we're proposing um, new codes to have further breakout under F42, um, new code F42.2 um, for the mixed obsessional thoughts and acts, F42.3, which would be the new code for the hoarding disorder and also having F42.8 for other, which is the standard convention for the ICD, and a .9 for unspecified. And again, we're inviting your comment both on the 2014 changes and the new code proposals for 2015. Um, for those of you who may be questioning why we are starting with F42.2 and not with F42.0 or .1, those codes are established WHO codes that were deactivated with an ICD-10-CM based on discussions with the APA uh, when we were harmonizing ICD-10-CM with DSM-4. Uh, so the other codes, the .0 and the .1, are not recommended um, to be restored to ICD-10-CM, so we're starting with F42.2. Okay, the, the next code is um, excoriation skin picking disorder uh, that is uh, on page uh, 41. Um, there are a group of um, conditions that are also in the obsessive compulsive uh, disorder area um, in terms of seemingly having some similar neurocircuitry um, that um, uh, links them together uh, and including, uh, included in this are what we've referred to as kind of body-focused repetitive behavior disorders. Um, uh, these can include uh, uh, conditions um, uh, such as trichotillomania or hair pulling disorder uh, and they also include uh, this condition of um, excoriation skin picking disorder. Now, uh, trichotillomania is already a, um, a code um, and a disorder in the ICD uh, system, uh, but um, a skin picking disorder is not. 
what is present in the ICD is a um, uh, is a condition that's um, an excoriation um, uh, condition in uh, the dermatology section um, that is referred to as factitial excoriation disorder, and that's the L98.1. Now, the problem with the leaving this just in the uh, dermatology section of L98.1 is that it isn't really clear what factitial excoriation disorder is. Um, it can be um, kind of something that is looked at from the, an old uh, kind of uh, psychosomatic, neurotic um, conception of anxiety causing rashes. Um, although a rash by itself is not uh, considered uh, an excoriation. It has to be accompanied by uh, actual uh, damage to the, um, uh, to the skin by uh, scratching or picking at it. Um, there's also the possibility that somebody could have a true factitial disorder uh, and factitious disorder uh, which in the past has been referred to as um, uh, kind of Munchausen syndrome, uh, has been uh, present in the, in the mental disorders section, uh, and it continues as uh, F68.1, uh, uh, and factitious disorder in ICD-9-CM is 300.19. So this, if somebody comes in and is and actually has a factitial dermatitis condition uh, in which they are purposely uh, and consciously, you know, picking at their skin for some secondary benefit, uh, that could be coded under the L98.1 currently. Uh, and if it were, it may require a mental disorder code as well, such as the F68.1. However, the skin picking disorder that we are referring to here is not one that is under kind of conscious control. This is one where the individual is, um, is repetitively picking out the, on their skin uh, to the point of damaging the skin uh, severely uh, and it is not something that they are consciously thinking about. This is, uh, it's a re repetitive body focused um, you know, disorder. Uh, it's uh, fairly uh, severe in nature, uh, and it really requires uh, a code in the uh, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder uh, domain. So, what we are recommending is that for the time being, the closest thing in the whole ICD that we could think of that would, would uh, bring it to attention was the factitial dermatitis, the L98.1. So we are uh, asking to have, for the time being, the excoriation skin picking disorder as an inclusion term under that. But for um, the uh, 2015 version, we would want to have it placed within the uh, OCD spectrum so that it would be the F42.4, uh, uh, so it would be in line with um, uh, the other uh, dis condition that we just talked about, hoarding uh, disorder, which is in the same group, uh, but it would have a separate code. And uh, this is adding now the decimal codes that are available that have not been used either by the WHO ICD-10 um, or that would uh, not conflict uh, with uh, other codes that are recommended for OCD uh, and for uh, hoarding disorder uh, or for any of the other uh, obsessive compulsive spectrum uh, body focus disorders that we would uh, recommend. Now there was a uh, question of why can't you just have it in the F98.8 uh, domain uh, that has um, a number of uh, conditions that include some things uh, such as uh, nail biting, uh, nose picking, uh, even excessive masturbation was placed in there in the ICD-10-CM uh, as kind of body focused repetitive behaviors. Uh, we don't think that um, 
this condition really fits specifically, you know, in this other category. Um, we um, uh, think that it, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that it would be focused specifically on the skin picking um, and excoriation issue would be better to place it for the time being in the, um, the L category to, um, to focus on that instead of in this throwaway kind of um, relatively mild um, uh, childhood and adolescent uh, disorders is what it's often referred to, uh, and have it um, as a, um, a specific disorder in the OCD uh, spectrum in uh, uh, 2015. So with that, I will stop and see if there are uh, any other uh, questions. <clears throat> Okay, so you have the proposals in front of you on page 42. Um, a couple of questions have arisen, and thanks to uh, Sue Bowman, who did provide some written early on comments, because she is on the phone today, but again, we don't have a moderated line, so um, I'll be posing some of these questions um, on her behalf. And one of the first questions that she had, Dr. Regeer, that if excoriation skin picking disorder is really a mental health disorder, would a better alternative be to actually classify the condition under F42, even though F42 doesn't have a, a breakout at this point, um, to rather classify it at F42 and not the L98.1 um, because that would interrupt trends. So for one year, you'd have the condition going to L98.1, and then in the following year, you would have that go to the F42. Um, so that was one of the questions that was raised. And my second question is, based on your comments earlier, it sounded like the, ficticia, the fictitial dermatitis could be present in a patient that also has the excoriation skin picking disorder. And under F, the proposed F42.4, we have an excludes one, which means they're mutually exclusive and can't be used together, but would that be better placed as an excludes two, which means that the two codes can be used together? No. No, I think our, our expectation is that they should be separate. If somebody really has a factitial, uh, you know, um, dermatitis, uh, in this case, excoriation condition, uh, that really is a separate condition from uh, the mental disorder. So we don't think that those two should be used together. The, um, what, what we were saying is that if somebody has the uh, factitial disorder, they might have also, uh, that is the factitial dermatitis, they might also have factitial disorder, which is a mental disorder. Okay, so uh, that's, a, that's a separate uh, issue. Um, you know, we think that uh, this could be a, uh, you know, somebody could come into a dermatologist or general physician and, and be scratching their skin, you know, to the point of bleeding and so forth uh, and scabbing and, and uh, serious uh, infections and so forth that is intended to uh, uh, obtain attention uh, for, for them, uh, medical care in some way, uh, and that that uh, could then be uh, also diagnosed with a mental disorder. But the, with regard to your other question, um, I think that's a, that's a serious um, uh, consideration. And if the recommendation uh, from the um, CDC and from the community would be to um, have this immediately placed under the OC uh, spectrum, uh, what that would do is obviously add an additional um, condition in the you know, under OCD, I mean, it's now coded as just F42. And so you would have, you know, one more uh, to confuse the insurance companies as to what is coming in. Uh, I think if they, if an insurance company sees the uh, skin picking disorder uh, coming in with an L code, um, you know, for that year, they may be more likely to, to pay for it or consider it. Uh, than if it just comes in with F42 or, I mean, it, that's, it's, it's an issue. I mean, I, we could, it can obviously be done anyway, you know, either way. 
Um, but it, um, those are the consequences of, you know, how, how, how specific do you want to be, you know, in this interim period uh, with the, um, uh, the, do you want to specify that it should be in the OCD spectrum or should, do you want to uh, specify that it, this particular uh, condition happens to be related to, um, to a problem with the skin? Any comments or questions on the further discussion? And, and of course, everyone you know on the line and in the audience, generally placement is, is focused on correct placement within the classification and not necessarily the reimbursement uh, insurance company issues. Dr. Regera and I have had this discussion. That's why he's smiling. Um, but again, we'd invite comment on that. Beth? It's bad. Um, I was just going to say, it might be a better placement at F42 where you're concerned, and we don't like to get a lot of it with the reimbursement, like Donna was saying, but you know, it might mean for that one year it requires an extra step before something's paid for, maybe documentation submitted or something. But in terms of trend data, it seems like right. a better placement, but we can look at it further. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there are no other comments, back to you, Dr. I Rieger. think that may be it. Was that it. I thought there was one more. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> one more. Okay, so the, the last uh, condition is uh, the premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, this is a condition that was actually included in the appendix for uh, DSM-4 with um, uh, recommended uh, diagnostic criteria. Uh, and what this is, is a, a severe mood uh, dysregulation uh, problem that occurs in the premenstrual uh, period uh, in some women that is far beyond just a uh, PMS or uh, mild premenstrual syndrome. Uh, this um, condition was defined well enough that uh, a series of clinical trials were actually undertaken uh, by various pharmaceutical companies uh, and um, the results were convincing enough to the FDA that it was actually the first non-DSM-4 uh, uh, disorder that was ever given a specific indication by the FDA. Uh, and so um, uh, they were able to get an indication uh, for a number of uh, disorder of, of uh, compounds, uh, fluoxetine probably being the most uh, common one uh, that was uh, used for treatment of this condition. But there are other treatments that are also being used for it. So based on the enormous amount of uh, research uh, information that was uh, generated uh, since 1994, uh, when this was um, identified, uh, the recommendation from the um, uh, work group is that it uh, also be uh, identified in the, uh, you know, actually in the mood disorder uh, section. Uh, now, the problem is that there is a premenstrual dis uh, syndrome or premenstrual tension syndrome in the N94.3 area that is a mild form of this. Um, and so the recommendation to get it in kind of that ballpark was uh, initially to just uh, use it as an inclusion term for that. Now this is very similar to the excoriation skin picking disorder area where you're putting it outside the mental disorder um, category uh, for the time being um, as a, and then of trying to bring it back into the F32 um, you know, category so that you would have it as an F32.81 uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder as an other depressive disorder um, and then have it as an excludes the uh, N94.3. Um, I think the, I, I'm confident that Beth and, and, and Donna would probably have the same concerns about having a, uh, uh, a temporary uh, lack of continuity uh, with this uh, going outside the uh, intended area where it really is a, uh, a serious 
um, you know, mood disorder uh, condition that um, can be disabling for some women uh, and having it just uh, merged with the um, uh, fairly commonly experienced uh, kind of premenstrual tension uh, that often accompanies uh, menstruation uh, periods uh, in, in a lot of women. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop and see what, um, what the recommendations are. Well, as Dr. Regera indicated, this is a similar issue to the excoriation skin picking disorder in that uh, for October 2014, the proposal is to have the premenstrual dysphoric disorder as an inclusion term under N94.3, but the October 2015 would be to create a new code back at F32. So again, a trending issue in that you would have one year of data captured using the N94.3, and then a year later you'd have a new code um, proposed at the F32. Um, so we invite comment on that as well as um, uh, moving forward with uh, implementation of a change um, in this last year of the partial freeze. Um, and then listening to Dr. Regeer's presentation, I had an additional question, and that would be about the N, um, N94.3. Um, did I understand that the premenstrual tension syndrome is actually a mild form of the premenstrual dysphoric disorder? Um, or are they mutually exclusive, or one is a more severe, um, because we, do have to worry about excludes notes, so we're, I'm not sure what type of an excludes note we should be using. Well, we consider the uh, premenstrual tension syndrome, you know, as a uh, normal physiologic reaction, uh, and we don't consider it a mental disorder. Uh, and so uh, that's the, it really would require an excludes uh, in order to make that distinction. Uh, so, uh, that may be another reason for um, perhaps not changing the um, um, changing the uh, location of this uh, for the single year. Uh, so it, it really is a um, uh, you know the the premenstrual uh, tension syndrome is um, we don't want to go there and just say that's a mild form of uh, PMDD. Okay, so just for clarification purposes, these two codes should not be used together. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? And again, we're inviting your comments on 2014 changes and 2015 changes. Okay. Okay, well, that uh, concludes our presentation. I want to thank uh, Adana and Beth for uh, giving us this opportunity to, uh, uh, to make the presentation. Uh, certainly our concern is that the entire coding community uh, is able to uh, respond to uh, the mental health community uh, that will be using uh, the DSM-5 uh, uh, immediately. They, they, you do have the problem uh, for ICD-9-CM that there is obviously no, chain, no chance for any coding revisions. Uh, since this um, came out in May of 2013, there was no opportunity to anticipate exactly, um, you know, what the diagnoses or the coding recommendations uh, would be uh, until the, uh, the publication date. Uh, I think uh, in this uh, interim period, the only recommendation I can make is that um, for coding purposes uh, that you avail yourself of a um, you know, a DSM-5, uh, the, either the desk reference, the very small uh, version, or if uh, you have access to the, um, the, the full volume, if you want to get into the, all the criteria uh, differences, that's uh, also, you know, readily available online from Amazon or from the APA uh, as well. So thank you very much for your attention. And just to complete the package, there are other um, tabular list uh, proposals that appear on page 45 and 46 that we would also invite your uh, comments on. 
And again, with some of the terminology changes that Dr. Regeer has described, the intent here is to make sure that if those terms are being used, that they do have um, a home somewhere within ICD-10-CM to facilitate people looking these up. So we invite comments. Uh, we're showing the tabular list uh, proposed changes. However, there obviously would be associated alphabetic index changes uh, with that that we didn't show uh, just to keep the package a little bit smaller. Um, and if there are no questions on that, we will move to the next set of proposals and I will turn the podium over to Beth Fisher. Okay, uh, we're on page 49, intracranial injury, uh, TBI. And um, this proposal uh, was submitted by the Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, but it references, as you'll see in the proposal on page 49, that it, it comes out of a report that was released earlier this year. Uh, I think it was in June 2013. Um, and it, that was published actually in a combination or with the Centers for Disease Control, NIH, uh, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Veteran Affairs um, concerned with uh, the uh, treatment and the diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. And as I have in the proposal here, the report stating that the federal stakeholders have been concerned regarding the need for a better classification of TBI symptoms using the ICD codes as acute or persistent or chronic for both epidemiological and clinical use. And so these four um, entities and other federal agencies are, have been reviewing the codes in ICD-10-CM uh, to make suggestions for changes that would improve TBI reporting in the United States. And one of the recommendations out of this report, and I do have a reference at the bottom if you want to read the entire report, it's quite lengthy, but one of the recommendations was to improve the coding and classification of TBI by working across the agencies and that all four participating agencies should continue to meet with professional academic, healthcare, and coding organizations to discuss the improvements in ICD-10-CM and TBI severity measures that can allow comparison of cases and outcomes. So specifically, the report recommended revisions to intracranial uh, injury code set in ICD-10-CM to improve uh, the accuracy of disease coding consistency with accepted case definitions, and their recommendation was to do this before October 1, 2014. Currently, in the ICD-10-CM, uh, Concussion is classified to subcategory S06.0, which is titled concussion, and the codes use the loss of consciousness to differentiate the severity of the concussion with the range extending from no loss of con consciousness to a loss of consciousness greater than 24 hours, including that with death. And this is similar to what it was classified in ICD-9-CM. And you may recall, again, about five or six years ago that we made some changes to the head injury chapter uh, categories in ICD-9-CM uh, related to traumatic brain injury. And I think this got quite a bit of discussion then. We felt we had so many years of trend data with those existing codes that we thought it best to leave those alone. Um, however, in working up this uh, report, they felt that we should look at this for ICD-10-CM before we got too far into it. Uh, so the proposal that we received from the VA, the um, Department of Veteran Affairs, was requesting that codes that represent concussion with a loss of consciousness greater than 30 minutes be removed, deleted, uh, deactivated, however we want to term that, Indicate, and also indicating that mild traumatic brain injury is synonymous with concussion and more severe forms of traumatic brain injury are, in, are inappropriately labeled as concussion right now. In addition, uh, the proposal stated that moderate and severe traumatic brain injury are neither classifiable as concussion or post-concussive syndrome, and so they proposed the revisions uh, to subcategory S06.0, uh, as I said, to delete the codes for concussion with a loss of consciousness greater than 30 minutes. Uh, 
In addition, the proposal has a, some additional coding instructional notes in this category to better direct the coders to use the specified intracranial injury codes when a concussion occurs with these injuries. And I have bold italics, so hopefully don't miss, <laughs> as we've been speaking a lot about some of these proposals uh, in the last couple of days, this particular proposal has been requested to have changes implemented during the partial code freeze, which is having it in place by the 10-1-2014 ICD-10 SIM implementation. So comments on the uh, need for the changes we, we would like, but also we'd like uh, comments on whether it's felt that these should be done during this partial freeze time frame. So on page 50, under category SO6, and I did in this proposal, I, I actually published everything that's at that category. Usually we only put the lines we're going to change or delete, but I thought it would be better to show things in context of how they appear right now. So under category S06, um, and then down to subcategory S06.0, uh, it, was, it was proposed to add the term mild traumatic brain injury to this uh, subcategory. Uh, again, equating mild traumatic brain injury to concussion, and to revise the excludes note to sort of state it a little bit better that if you have a concussion with other, with intracranial injuries that are classified in other subcategories in SO6, that you should code to that specific intracranial injury subcategory rather than separately coding concussion. And then the major part of the proposal here is that SO6.0X concussion. Uh, the proposal is to delete the codes that, uh, that um, reference concussion with a loss of consciousness greater than 30 minutes. So what we would end up with is just a few codes, uh, SO6.0X0, concussion without loss of consciousness, S06.061, concussion with a loss of consciousness of 30 minutes or less, and then down to S06.06X9, concussion with a loss of consciousness of unspecified duration, and that's where the default concussion not otherwise specified would be uh, continue to be placed. Now, in addition, I like to always point out that uh, in this category, as with most of the categories in this chapter, the seventh character uh, has, we have seventh characters applying to these codes, so in, in um, Although it looks like seven codes we're deleting, in, in actuality it's deleting 21 codes because of that applicability of the seventh character. And then, uh, just again to cover the rest of the proposal, on page 51 uh, it was requested to add an excludes one note for concussion to send the coder back to SO6.0X, meaning if all they have is concussion, they shouldn't, they shouldn't code it under SO06.8, they should be back at the S06.0X. And also under S06.9, the unspecified intracranial injury, to add the subterm uh, inclusion note, traumatic brain injury, NOS, and excludes one notes, uh, again to point people back to more um, specific intracranial injury uh, codes rather than to use SO06.9. And then continuing on page 52, uh, some index changes shown here. Obviously, if we were to remove codes, we would adjust the index appropriately and remove those from the index. But to uh, more clearly index traumatic brain injury, if all they say on the chart is traumatic brain injury, that we want uh, the coder to use S06.9. I have a dash showing there, but it actually shouldn't be there. Um, but to, right now we have a note also that says um, that the coder should see category S06, and we think that's sort of misleading to send you to one place and then to a code in another place. So we're just trying to be more consistent in that way. So um, with that, I would invite any comments uh, about this proposal. Um, I, I think this is Luana. From, you can state your I'm name. I'm Luanna Ciccarelli from the American Academy of Neurology. Um, just two things we wanted to comment, and we'll send comments uh, written afterwards. But we do agree with the deletion from S06 point, uh, the OX2 through the SO6 point X8. I believe those are the right numbers. Mm -hmm. But deleting all of those that were above 30 minutes, we agree with deleting all of those. The one thing that we oppose, and uh, we don't support 
um, adding the inclusion term mild TBI to concussion. Um, basically, the argument is that mild TBI is a severity measure and concussion is a neurophysiologic process, and that they're not synonymous, and that concussion less than 30 minutes may result in TBI, but that not all TBI is a concussion. So, and, you know, we can submit further in, in writing afterwards, but those are the two main points we wanted to make sure we got through today. Okay, okay. thank you, Luana. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is probably the first meeting in like 25 years that Dr. Powers couldn't make, so we appreciate you sending those comments. Uh, uh, also, uh, as Donna pointed out, um, Sue Bowman was very vigilant yesterday on her wait for her flight out to Chicago and did look at the topic packet, and she um, also had a, a concern she wanted to express uh, that, sh that, um, uh, that AHIMA opposes, or Sue says, I oppose the implementation of um, these changes in 2014, they do not meet the criteria for implementation during the code freeze, and they're too, uh, they are much too major to implement on the ICD-10 go live date. Uh, and also, uh, they have a concern about how the diagnosis of concussion with loss of consciousness greater than 30 minutes would be coded, because right now we do have that code in ICD-9 CM. Uh, she said, is the coder supposed to tell the physician his, his diagnosis of concussion is incorrect? Uh, we'll probably have to look at that a little further. We had a little concern about that too, but I think we need to um, just take uh, the comments that we get by November 15th and then weigh the <laughs> pros and cons of how far to go with loss of consciousness. Okay, if there are no more comments, then I'll move on to um, what I think is our last topic. <laughs> Plus, it's on page 53, placenta previa versus low-lying placenta. And as you probably can guess. This came from the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, uh, that currently in ICD-10-CM, uh, placenta previa and low-lying placenta are both classified to the same category, O44, placenta previa. And it's this category right now is further subdivided to indicate whether it's with or without hemorrhage. And so ACOG is proposing an expansion uh, at this category to allow differentiating uh, between complete placenta previa, partial placenta previa, and low-lying placenta. Uh, they give some explanation here of the difference between them, placenta previa being the condition where a portion of the placenta covers the internal cervical os. It may be either complete or it's completely covered. The a cervical os is completely covered by placenta or partial where the internal cervical os is partially covered by the placenta. And both of these can result in hemorrhage requiring close monitoring and often requiring delivery by C-section. And ACOG indicates that from a clinical standpoint, uh, the complete placenta previa is a more serious condition that leads to greater morbidity in early delivery, whereas the partial placenta previa is more likely to resolve as pregnancy progresses. The low-lying placenta, on the other hand, is a condition where the placenta implants low in the, in the uterus, but it doesn't cover the cervix. And a low-lying placenta will typically require less follow-up or fewer visits uh, to assess the condition and often resolves prior to delivery. The condition can also result in hemorrhage, but it's more likely that conservative therapy will be prescribed and the condition will resolve, uh, is less likely to result in an early delivery. So. Uh, ACOG was proposing to create additional subcategories under O44 to allow unique codes to track these conditions separately and continue uh, the ability to indicate whether or not hemorrhage is present. But what it, I wanted to point out is in this proposal, it, um, they propose to change uh, what has been the default uh, by ICD-10 and in, uh, in WHO as well as the way we carried it over into ICD-10-CM. Right now the default uh, if one just writes placenta previa, sends a coder to the code with hemorrhage. And the proposal, as we will show down below, changes that uh, to, to be without hemorrhage. And ACOG indicates that that is because uh, most of the time in today's practice, they say these conditions, uh, either, um, either type of placenta previa, are diagnosed and delivered before hemorrhage. And therefore, the proposal to have the default to point it to without hemorrhage uh, for each of these conditions is, is what their preference is. Um, additionally, they indicate that the default for just placenta previa NOS should be indexed to complete placenta previa without hemorrhage. And so the proposal below uh, 
indicates these defaults in the index, we would modify it to reflect this as well. So uh, the tabular modifications proposed are to change the title of um, subcategory 044.0 to be complete placenta previa NOS or without hemorrhage and to delete the term for low implantation of placenta specified as without hemorrhage uh, and then to add the term placenta previa NOS to this subcategory and have a breakout at the fifth, char fifth character uh, to indicate uh, the trimester that, that we um, revise the titles, but we've got the um, indication of the trimester that this is occurring. And on the next page, 54, um, to revise the title of 044.1 to be complete placenta preview with hemorrhage and to remove the inclusion terms that you see underneath 044.1 because they'll be placed in other uh, subcategories that we create and have an excludes one for labor and delivery complicated by hemorrhage from VASA previa 0694 and to modify the existing code titles of 044.10 through 13 for, to say that they're for complete placenta previa uh, by trimester and then create new subcategory of 0442 for the partial placenta previa without hemorrhage and add the inclusion term marginal placenta previa NOS or without hemorrhage and new codes of 044.20 through 23 to indicate the trimester. And then 044.3 to create a new subcategory of placenta, partial placenta previa with hemorrhage. And similarly, the, sub, the codes underneath it to, to indicate by trimester. 044.4 to uh, create new subcategory for the low-lying placenta, NOS, or without hemorrhage. And that's where we would include low implantation of placenta, NOS, or without hemorrhage, and create uh, four new codes there to indicate by trimester. And finally, 044.5, the low-lying placenta with hemorrhage. And again, the inclusion term, low implantation of placenta with hemorrhage, with this, uh, um, the codes 044.50 through 53 to indicate uh, the trimester. And I, I can't... I, did there, were there any oops, questions or comments? I didn't notice if our representative from ACOG was here. Oh, there's Don. Oh, there you are. Okay. How did we uh, represent everything as you anticipated? I thought we worked pretty closely with them. So are there any questions or comments? Okay. Then uh, I think Donna will take over. Well, actually, that concludes um, the diagnosis portion of the presentations. Uh, we thank you so much for persevering and uh, joining us here in Baltimore. Um, and thank you, all of those who are on the webcast and also in the dial-in. Again, November 15, I believe, is in the topic package for um, receipt of uh, comments on all of the proposals. Um, that's the deadline, but we'd love to have them sooner since this does have implications um, in terms of what does become part of an addenda or not. Um, and that would be specific to the inclusion terms in the tabular list and alphabetic index. Uh, because again, unless the proposal meets the criteria uh, established for the partial freeze, uh, no new codes are being entertained except for the ones that were requested, but we invite your comment on that as well. Uh, we thank you. And uh, Pat, does CMS have any closing remarks? Okay. Noting none, thank you so much, and we look forward to receiving your comments.